Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome on behalf of the IFA, Germany's oldest intermediate organization for international cultural relations. To our online talk today, the Asian 21st century. This online talk is taking place within a series of uh, totally locally Stuttgart talks, the Stuttgarter Weltgespräche. In this series, we discuss urgent questions on the relationship between global and local. Focus is on successful examples of cooperation, distinct scope of action, and social innovation. In times where more and more people feel, I would say, helpless with the effect of globalization, transnational collaboration seems more important than ever. Today, we are talking about the Asian century. After the so-called European 19th century and the American 20th, is the 21st Asian. We will discuss which role will Asia play within the future world order. Where is Europe within global developments? Can growth in Asia lead to more global justice? Which contribution can cultural policy add to strengthen our relations and cultural understanding towards Asia? So as you see, we have an exciting 75 minutes ahead in our talk, a lot of questions to be answered, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, welcome and great to have you here with us today. For those who don't know me yet, my name is Corinna Egera. I'm a professional presenter and moderator in business and politics topics. And uh, oh, I have the great pleasure to guide you through our short program today. Before we start, I do have just a few organizational details for you. The event, as I said, will last about 75 minutes and uh, we are recording this event. You can ask questions anytime and that's possible via the chat and I do want to encourage you to do so because we certainly want to make sure we answer the questions that you have. So use the chat button on the bottom of the of your uh, of your monitor and just type in whatever you want to feel or want to you feel like want to know and I'll try to pick up as many as I can during the talk. Well Let's get started. First of all, I'd like to give the word to Dr. Odila Trivel. She is a head of dialogue and research at the IFA. Dr. Trivel. Thank you, Corinna. Dear Parakana, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you on behalf of IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, to today's discussion on the topic, the Asian 21st century, question mark. Today, Asian countries occupy leading positions in the global economy and are becoming ever more politically relevant. Global historians might add, they do it again. However, while geopolitical narratives between East and West shape our perspectives, the world is facing a variety of common challenges, such as global warming and the tackling of technological challenges in our daily lives. Especially in the financial and economic sector, our structures are intertwined already, enabling close ties, but also vulnerabilities at the same time. Therefore, multilateral cooperation at eye level in different sectors such as economy, science, cultural heritage, arts should be achieved. And the first step for cooperation is, as we believe, dialogue. That is what we're trying to enforce. As an intermediary organization for cultural policy, IFA makes a contribution by representing a cultural concept that understands culture not as a haven of withdrawal, but as a space of openness. Organizations, federations of states such as the, as the EU, national governments, as well as regions and cities are integral for shaping this coexistence. It is particularly important to include civil society in this process of political participation. And this is our intention to provide such an occasion and such a space here today. With today's event, we cordially invite you to participate in the discussion about Asia's past, present, future, and its role in the world and with us together. We are delighted to welcome today Parakana as our expert to this talk in this, as mentioned, in the series called Total, Total Glocal in German, translated totally globally, die Stuttgarter Weltgespräche. I would also like to thank our team at IFAR for organizing and coordinating today's event. 
I wish us all a stimulating, exciting, and informative evening event and give the floor now back to Ms. Egera. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Odila Trivel. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to an exciting talk. I'm talking today to Farag Khanna. He's a leading global strategy advisor, political scientist, and best selling author, ladies and gentlemen. He's founder and managing partner of FutureMap, a data and scenario based strategy consulting firm. And he worked for the Econo World Economic Forum in Geneva and was advisor to the program Global Trends 2030 of the National Intelligence Council in the United States. I would say he is a true global citizen. He was born in India, grew up in the United Arab Emirates, Germany, and the United States, studied in the UK and in the US, and during the past years has lived both, well, in the US and now in Singapore. In addition, he has extensively traveled 150 countries, and I would say he loves the top. Not only that, he has climbed numerous 20,000 plus peaks, foot plus peaks, he has also reached the top career-wise. He was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and frequently appears in the media worldwide. He received the OECD Future Leaders Prize and was awarded Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum and as fellow of the Robert Bosch Academy. His book, The Future's Agent, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century, was just published in 2019. Welcome, Parag, and a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karina. Pleasure to be with you. So as for our procedure, we just uh, before we start our talk, we will just do a small poll now just to know who is with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you were asked now, you see on the window uh, on your screen, um, a, a little poll. And after that, we will uh, start our discussion for Rock and I. And as I said, I'll pick up questions via the chat, via the chat anytime. So you should see our poll right now. Yes, it is on the screen. And the question is, from which part of the world are you watching our event right now? We're interested. Where are you based? Oh, that looks very European. <laughs> oh, now we're getting more to Asia. That's very interesting. And the second question is, which sector do you work in? So we're eager to see from which parts, uh, not only of the world, but from which, from which sectors you join us today. And uh, look for the results that we will probably get in... Uh, well, let me, uh, can, I, can I ask you a quiz question while they're answering the poll? Yes, sure. Karina, who coined the word glocal? Where does the word glocal come from? Who invented it? I, frankly, I don't really know. It's, it's being used everywhere. What's, what's the answer? <laughs> it's, you can use it in German. We say glocal. You say in English, no? Don't you? It's I think become, global uh, and local. So. Does anyone else know from your team? Anyone? No, we certainly know that we didn't invent it, but we came <laughs> up with this. We came I, up this for this for this series because, I, um, yeah, because we, we do a lot and we thought a lot about and wrote about the the, the intersection of both and the interdependency of the twenty first century's living condition, and so that's why I love this 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 combination. It's a great word. Yeah. It was um, one of two people, uh, and I'm not sure which but they were both political scientists, uh, uh, both recently passed away. One is Benjamin Barber, the political theorist, uh, who's yeah. very famous for his work on democratic uh, theory, and cosmopolitanism, or James Rosenau, who was an international relations theorist. They both used the word going back to the early 1990s, even the late 1980s. Yeah. And I was a huge admirer of both of them. Uh, I think it was more uh, Benjamin Barber, but uh, they I think so too. It, it, globalization. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Through this text, yeah. All right. Well, interesting question. And uh, now we have the uh, the results of our poll here. 86% come from Europe, well, <laughs> and 14% from Asia, none of the other continents. And we have 36% from NGOs and 29% from universities and uh, well, then followed by government. 
and think tank organizations. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for that. Very interesting. But uh, yes, once again, good to have you here with us. Parag, let's get into our discussion. Um, as I said, the title of your book is The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century. So this is a question back now. How did you get to that topic, actually? Well, it's in a way very intuitive. Uh, I've been living in Asia for the last uh, seven years or so. And uh, this is probably the third book that was written entirely while living in Singapore. So I think that, you know, it's not the first time that I've been writing about Asia as a geopolitical entity or region, as the center of gravity in the world. In many ways, that's what, uh, you know, students or people roughly my age or younger, we've grown up already with Asia being a big part of the curriculum uh, in economics and, and geopolitics. So what the reason though, why I wanted to write a book specifically on this topic is because I felt, uh, and this is of course the case with anyone who writes a book about something, you see the gaps, you see the weaknesses in the literature. So some obvious ones are that most books about Asia are basically about China. So that was a huge gap. You know, people talk about Asia as if it's just China or China plus. And I thought to myself, well, there are about four and a half or five billion people in Asia. Only 1.4 billion of them are Chinese. What about the rest? Mm -hmm. Obviously having, you know, being born in India, uh, it's more than just a passing interest. Yeah. Second, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. sorry, no, go ahead. And the second big gap is that uh, people have not treated Asia as a system. We talk about and write about Asia as if it's always being shaped by the United States or in the colonial era by Europe or in the framework of US led alliances by Japan and Australia. But we've never really tried to construct, you know, an inside out appreciation and understanding of the dynamics of the Asian system. In international relations, we use this word system, not just, uh, you know, in a very formal way, it has a very formal definition. And there's quite frankly, never been a book about the Asian system, literally never. Um, and a system again is where the units, the countries, the states, the empires, have more intense relations with each other than with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, those, it can be a, a violent system or a peaceful system, it doesn't matter. The definition of a system is not normative. It can, it, you can have war constantly. Europe, the vast majority of European history is the history of a conflictual system. Europe has been a conflictual system for millennia. It's only been a peaceful system for the last few, few decades, right? Mm -hmm. But it's been a system mm -hmm. for centuries. Asia has not been a system because of colonialism, because of the Cold War. It's been geographically contiguous, but India had more to do with Britain and Japan more to do with America and Australia more with Europe. It didn't really have a gravity pulling itself into each other. And that is now the case. For the first time in 500 years, Asia is truly a system. So I wanted to also make that very, very concrete. So those are my two motivations. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. When you say uh, system, is, is that what you mean when you talk about a European, an American, or an Asian uh, century? Or is, that, is, is there more to a system? Well, I wanted to be clear that, you know, even if Asia never influenced the rest of the world, there is still an Asian system. So it's worth discussing the Asian system because Asia is the majority of the human population and about half of the global economy. So Asia does not have to influence the rest of the world directly to be worthy of study. Asia is much of the world. And I, you know, obviously from a Eurocentric or Western centric standpoint, that's a bit of a shocking statement, right? Because I'm obviously saying that the Atlantic world, the Western alliance um, and, uh, you know, sort of, sort of Western civilization, if you will, or the West taken as a cultural kind is not the center of the world. For Asia, 
it's the periphery. You are the periphery. You know, America is the periphery. America is not the center. Europe. So it might might be quite stunning, you know, for people to hear that. But it's also irrefutable facts. I mean, the, these are facts, right? It's it's not a debatable point that five billion people live in this greater Asian region. It's just a fact. It's not a debatable point that half the world's GDP is here. That's a fact. Right. So I wanted to, again, write that inside out. And the funny thing is that Asian Asians, people who are born and raised here uh, in this region, don't write things like that because they don't actually care to think about that rest. The fact that they have not written that is evidence that it's true because they don't actually care about the rest. Right? They don't actually spend much time caring what Europeans think about them or what Americans think about them. So I think I came here as an American to write about the inside out Asian view because Asians are too busy being Asians and living in their Asian universe, which is the world really as far as they are concerned. And there's a historical point that I think is worth mentioning here that's very much about Europe. If you remember the, the early uh, centuries of global colonialism or globe, the expansion of global trade in the 16th century is with the Portuguese and the Spanish empires. Remember that geographically speaking, European kingdoms and monarchies were very, very small states. They were just you know, very remote provinces from a global standpoint, right? What made European micro states and kingdoms into global empires was of course to have a presence in Asia and to make their trade hubs in Asia and to establish colonies in Asia. So the reason that particularly Portugal and the Netherlands and then Britain became global empires is because they became Asian empires, right? Of course, North America comes in as well, but you cannot be global unless you are Asian, right? You cannot pretend that you are globally influential or globally significant as a company or as a country, unless you have a real influence in Asia, right? Mm -hmm. So it's always been part, by always, I mean, five, 600 years. If you're not relevant in Asia, you're not actually global. Uh, so I think that's an interesting local point. The truth <laughs> is that you are just local unless you are a presence in Asia. Uh -huh. But again, the reverse is not true, right? Asians don't have to dominate South America to be global because to be very blunt, South America or Africa are not as important as Asia, right? Mm -hmm. Asia, again, is where the center of the world population is and economy is, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not trying to disparage any re region. I'm trying to quantify what we mean when we say global or influential. So it's a very interesting turning of the tables. And I don't do it to be rhetorical because that's not my job. I'm not a politician, right? I'm, I'm an analyst. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm analyzing, you know, why... Asia is the way it is, what it has meant historically and what it means uh, today. And yes, to some extent, you know, maybe I'm reflecting how Asians view the world. And I may even, you know, dangerously be giving them some ideas about, you know, their, their, the confidence that they, that they could have or should have about their role in the world. But in a way, uh, this is the way it already is. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm asking myself when you use a term like the Asian century uh, and before that the European or the American century, is there something like a transition point or a starting and a finishing point uh, to one, yeah, one gets started, the other is over? Where do, where do you see that? It's a great, great question. So, you know, I, there, there's, there's two answers. The first is that there is definitely no, uh, you know, formal, if you will, turning <laughs> Point in, in this, well, I mean, sort of yes and no. The thing is that everyone would set it differently. And for me, I try to amalgamate and kind of think about transitionary periods rather than points. Um, some would say that, you know, it's much easier to identify the point at which America became the dominant global power. It's the end of World War II and it's the Suez crisis of 1956. So you have a two decade period where clearly Great Britain's role was shrunk uh, immensely and America's role 
became completely globally dominant. By the end of World War II, the United States represented 50 five zero percent of global GDP. So there you can identify a very narrow period. When it comes to Asia, I like to think of it definitely, uh, again, trend, you know, starting points and momentum generating and, and, and so forth. Obviously, you know, the rise of Japan, you know, Japan by 1975 was already the world's second largest economy, right? And as you probably remember, Americans used to fear Japan as their great rival, not as a military one, just as an economic one. So by the 1970s, you already had rising sun, Asia rising. And that was before China, right? China at that point was still a completely uh, you know, feudal agrarian uh, uh, province and politically not only communist, but utterly Maoist authoritarian. And then in the late 1970s, you had a major China transition. So you had Japan, the tiger economies like South Korea, China's rise, and all of that was before the end of the Cold War. But just because Asian states were becoming important, it doesn't mean that it was the Asian century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question you rightly ask is, what about the actual anchoring of the global system around Asia? And I would say that certainly the beginning of the process would be the collapse of the Soviet Union, because without the collapse of the Soviet Union, Asian and the end of the Cold War, Asian countries could not focus more on their internal relations than their external relations. So the building of the Asian system definitely really kind of begins with the end of the Cold War. But in terms of becoming an obvious day to day fact, you might say it was in the last 10 years when China surpassed the United States as the world's largest economy in PPP terms, when you had the uh, announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative and the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, when the internal trade within Asia surpassed Asia's trade with the rest of the world, that was also 2014, 2015. Uh, all of these things happened in between 2014 and 2016, some of these very significant milestones. And that's actually just when I started um, uh, writing this book. Uh, but again, the, the term Asian century, as you know, is actually comes, goes, go, dates back to the 18th century with Napoleon talking about China. And, uh, you know, even in the late 19th century, there were forecasts about what the Asian century might look like and who would lead it. But I will differentiate myself very clearly from those people because I never say that the rise of Asia means the decline of the West, ever. Mm -hmm. okay. right? I have said that the West is not the center mm -hmm. of the world. I have not said that the West is not important. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I'm concerned, the world is multipolar. Uh, when you look at the structure of power economically and its economic foundations, which is by far the most important component of power, the world is clearly multipolar. It's an American, European, and Asian world, roughly equal with Asia a little bit heavier, but obviously with a lot more people. But the world will remain multipolar for a long time. So the difference between the transition from a European world to an American world or an American world to an Asian world is that your Asia is not destroying the West. It's not superseding the West. It's not eliminating the West. It's not conquering the West. None of those things are happening. Mm -hmm. And I liken it to just an additional layer of paint. The world, the entire planet Earth has a European layer of paint, a coating of European paint. We have sovereignty. We have democracy. We have modern political institutions. We have our borders. Everything about the organization of the planet is European, right? In so many ways, and it has not gone away. And we have an American layer from the American military to the English language, the structure of capitalism and international financial networks. That's the American layer of paint. And now you have Asian layers of paint. You have Chinese and Japanese and Indian people and trade and supply chains and their, and their other kinds of cultural and, and, and influence. Mm -hmm. all over the world. So one doesn't replace the other. And I think that's the beauty of looking at these issues from a cultural standpoint, rather than assuming that, that the world, that world history is a zero sum competition mm -hmm. amongst large blocks, mm -hmm. because that's not true of Asian history and it's not true of global history. Mm -hmm. So it is getting eventually more diverse if I understand you correctly. Absolutely. Uh
let's let's take a minute and uh, look at the commercial aspects of the uh, yeah of the Asian uh, system or century. Uh, as I would say, we do have a couple of questions already coming in on the uh, RCEP, on the uh, economic partnership that's just been launched, but uh, let's stick to that later. Um, why has Asia really become so powerful economically within the last years? What, what is the, uh, what's the reason there and which are the most important sectors that you would define? Mm -hmm. Well, those are those are very good questions. You know, with with all uh, stories of economic growth, it's it's uh, there's multiple factors and drivers. Obviously, there's demographics, right? The population of multiple Asian countries has tripled or quadrupled since 1945. So you have again the largest concentration of people in the world, and that's not only true today. It's 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 been true obviously for centuries. But so then the other part of the story is infrastructure investment, economic reforms, investment in human capital and education, uh, connectivity across uh, these countries. Again, they're growing trade, their connection to global supply chains, empowerment of women. To be honest, economic history is a long laundry list of the things that you can do correctly, you know, not to mention technological inputs, obviously. Um, and Asia is one, one by one, country by country, doing all of those things, right? Uh, following that playbook. Uh, in many ways, it's not necessarily special as a story, but it's larger and it's faster because part of the process of history is that knowledge diffuses faster and technology diffuses faster and countries can learn from the experience of others faster. Um, and global supply chains and technology transfer and investment make all of this happen faster. So that's why Asia has, has risen so incredibly, you know, breathtakingly uh, quickly. Now, in terms of key sectors, quite frankly, the answer is absolutely everything. Um, and the, the, there's a big difference between invention and innovation. And a lot of people like to say that Asians don't innovate, they don't, or rather they don't invent, they just copy. But I think anyone who knows Asia knows that's not true, right? If you look at uh, scientific advancement in a wide range of areas, whether it's medical sciences, you know, cancer treatments, and or obviously artificial intelligence in China and so forth, there is a great many areas where Asians both invent and innovate. There's no question that this is the most innovative region in the world by far. Um, it's not even a contest. And again, innovation does not mean you invented something. Uh, in, uh, innovation means you apply it. You apply it in a novel way to your own context, to your market, to your society, to your economy. So for all of the things that we take for granted or, or wish we could in day-to-day -day life, you know, the, the, the phone that you use, who has the fastest phones with the best cameras, right? It's Asians. Who has the super apps where you can do cashless payments for anything, you know, QR codes to scan anything, all of your, anything that you need to, for, for data to show on everything, bandwidth speeds, internet speed, everything is better in Asia, right? And it's much better in China than it is in America or the United States. I mean, leaps and bounds better because they wrote their regulations from scratch. You know, they were consumer friendly and industry friendly. They are not data privacy friendly obviously, right? They're very un-European in that sense. But in terms of innovation that empowers consumers and citizens, there's no question that Asia is, is five to 10 years ahead of the rest of the earth, even in areas that were innovated or invented in America, right? You know, e-commerce, sure, Amazon's great, but Alibaba is way faster, right? Um, and in terms of payment platform and so forth, it's just leaps and bounds better. So again, the innovation, there, this is again, not something that we can debate. If the facts are on the table, the scale is massively tilted towards Asia. That's just an objective fact, right? Um, and the, the room for improvement though is significant in terms of just scale, right? Um, let's remember that if Asia were a country or even Southeast Asia, this region where I live of 700 million people, if it were a country, it would be by far the most unequal country in the world, right? There's billions of people who are still poor in Asia, billions, mm -hmm. especially in India, right? Mm -hmm. And in parts of Southeast Asia. But that's part of why you know that Asia will still grow a lot 
because these governments are investing the most in infrastructure and connectivity and internet access and mobile finance and you know rural electrification and all of these things, Asian countries, even the poorest countries are trying very hard to do these things in public policy and public finance and social policy. So I'm optimistic that, that uh, even though they have such high inequality, they're making big efforts to reduce poverty. Mm -hmm. What's the typical Asian strength that you would define there when you say it's everything so much faster? How come? What's the typical well, strength? You know, in, in economics, you would call it the advantage of late development, right? Again, these things were not invented in Asia. The internet was not invented in Asia. The mobile phone was not invented in Asia. The automobile was not invented in Asia. Electric cars were not invented in Asia. But all of these things are here now, right? In larger number, bigger markets, more state support. Obviously, that's one big factor. Um, you know, again, writing the more effective regulations, less legacy um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's all of those, uh, you know, political, we call it political economy, right? All of these political economy factors have come together to allow countries to do, do these things in a strategic way. So strategic national modernization is not an accident, right? Uh, it, that's the whole point. It's strategic. It's premeditated. It's done according to a master plan, a design. Right. You know, Japan knows 10 years in advance where they're going to build the next high speed rail lines. You know, so does China um, and they get it done. Now, again, we're, we're not we haven't yet talked about, obviously, the, the political issues, democracy, rights and freedom. Right. All of these things come at a cost. Mm -hmm. uh, but just remember that Asians have made their own decisions. Right. They're not having the debate that you or I may have now or that Europeans have. As you know, I've spent a lot of time in Germany and I'm, I'm debating with Germans and German politicians regularly and, and they still carry this bias that unless Asia does things the way we do things or have done things, it must fail because it's not morally correct according to our view. But you need to understand, you know, again, I say this as someone, I can put on a German hat, I can put on an American hat. I can understand your point of view, but you, you know, not you personally, but, you know, the, this, this uh, crowd of people in Europe or in America, in Berlin or Washington, don't seem to be able to understand that point of view, right? Which mm -hmm. is that, you know, we have way more people than you. We have 10 times more people than you. You know, innovation, modernization, development will not happen by accident with 5 billion people. <laughs> Silicon Valley will not happen by accident, right? Food will not get on people's tables by accident, right? This is a crowded and layered and, and very heavily divided and fragmented and poor or has been part of the world. So you really do have to understand the way these people are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They already understand how you understand the world because a lot of them were educated in Europe. They were shaped by American, by European colonialism, by American dominance, right? Every Asian understands how Westerners think, right? But the reverse is not true. <laughs> I, yeah, we... there's, a, there's a distinction. I'm not contradicting myself. Earlier, mm -hmm. I said that Asians don't care what you think, but I never said they don't understand what you think right? They perfectly well understand. Asia is a large set of post-colonial countries. Mm -hmm. They were dominated by Europe for centuries. Yeah. Asians understand perfectly well what the European worldview is and what the American worldview is. Mm -hmm. It is completely inevitable on any planet of the, in any part of the planet to know mm. what, what Europe has done and what America has done, but the reverse mm. is not true. Mm. And I've come here to understand the reverse and to reflect that reverse view. Yeah. Global citizen, as I said, yeah, well, very interesting. Uh, let, let's let's look at Asia um, or the parts of Asia a little bit. As, as you said in the beginning, it's not only China, it's not only India. Um, so, so, so what what about the uh, when we refer to Asia, we often mean just simply China or a little bit more. Um, so, so what are the, the 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 big regions that you would talk about? One hand, and then we also and I'm just adding this. I uh, have an interesting question from someone from our audience saying uh, that the middle powers in Asia, would they have to choose sides? Is it not a century of alliance uh, that's ahead of us that they will choose sides either the US way or the Chinese way, you know, like a bipolar thing? Right. So again, that's a very, it's a very common view um, that 
Asia's middle powers or swing states, you know, especially here in Southeast Asia, have to choose sides, you know, and, and make an alliance, you know, or be part of an alliance. Again, that's not at all true. In Asian history, there are almost, almost no alliances. Asians don't think of themselves as having to form rigid alliances and do balance of power against each other. Yes, such dynamics exist, but not in the framework of institutionalized alliances like NATO and so forth, because that's not how Asians you know, view their relationships with each other. Um, they are always practicing what we call hedging, right? They're saying, I don't know who's going to win in this dispute between China and Japan or China and Korea or Japan and Korea or China and India, but I'll just be friends with all of them and whoever wins, I'll stay friends with them, right? That's the way Asians operate. Um, if they have to team up to defeat a hegemon, like of course, in the case of World War II, where Asian powers had to resist uh, Japanese imperialism and that required China and the support of the United States um, and, and Korea and Southeast Asian powers to, to reject Japanese imperialism. That wasn't a case of alliances though, that was anti-imperial resistance, right? So Asian countries today do not use the language of, you know, we have to choose sides, which side shall we choose? That is the way that people in the West and scholars and analysts and diplomats in the West talk about the way they think the dynamics will be because they think that there is a US-China global cold war, the world is becoming bipolar again, and therefore like the last cold war, each country must choose a side between the two. But we are not in a new global cold war, there is not a new bipolarity between the US and China, the world is not being carved up into two rival camps. Uh, and therefore, Asians do not believe that each of them must choose a side. They correctly view the world as, again, much more layered and interdependent. They get investment from Japan and they trade with China and they have military relations with America. And they are constantly shifting these patterns and teams and doing business in all directions. They are actually you know, cre creating a situation where China and America and India and Japan and Europe are all bidding to have more influence in their countries, like in the in Thailand or the or the Philippines or Indonesia, so they are not choosing sides. They will not choose sides. No one is asking. No one is is pretending that they must. I mean, sometimes some American officials may come here and say, "We want you to be on our side." And the next day, some Chinese officials may arrive and say, "We would like you to be on our side." Mm -hmm. But pretty much every Asian country that has some sovereignty right, like uh, Thailand or Indonesia or Philippines, certainly Vietnam, India, none of these countries actually pick a side. So the, the fundamental lesson, you know, just to, you know, draw it to a, a punchline so everyone can remember, Asia will never choose sides. So, you know, I, I, I hope that everyone can simply remember this one sentence, Asia will never choose sides. Mm -hmm. Asians do not choose sides. You cannot tell Asians that the rules of the game are that they must choose sides because actually they are the ones making the rules of the game, which is that they will not choose sides. You really have to understand the way it works mm -hmm. from the inside because what I'm saying represents the perspective of you know three plus billion people, right? And that's the way India operates. That's the way Indonesia operates. That's the way the big countries are, are operating. And they have found ways to resist China and to resist America. So the truth is that the, the point of view that says we will not choose sides is winning. Therefore, it's worth your time to understand why that is true. Mm -hmm. Before we move on to the RCEP, I just want to understand one more thing or ask you one thing that is um, when you said uh, actually Europe invented a lot of things and then the Asians came and innovated on top of that, no? Cars came from, from here and then- oh, uh, so Don't forget the American chapter in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question goes to Europe. Where do you yeah. see Europe's future role economy-wise in, in, in that respect? 
Well, so Europe as an economic region unto itself, I am more positive about than most people, certainly way more than, than Americans, than, than most Americans, because Americans are very dismissive of Europe as a geopolitical actor, and they view it as, um, you know, sort of rife with uh, stasis and having, uh, you know, bloated states and uh, heavily indebted, you know, welfare systems and so on. Uh, my view is that, you know, Europe, uh, is is governed by uh, principles of parliamentary democracy and social solidarity. And I view those as very virtuous things. And I think that uh, even with the pandemic being as bad as it is, um, the public support has been you know far stronger than in, in most other parts of the world. And certainly, of course, way more than the United States. So I'm certainly a believer in Europe. And I believe that Europe learns from crisis and the patterns of modern history show that in terms of um, taking this opportunity to evolve from the uh, monetary union towards a fiscal union, uh, these sorts of you know, the large bailouts, uh, socializing European debt, launching more sovereign euro bonds, uh, making you know a stronger push for the euro to be a reserve currency, this $2 trillion budget over the next five, seven years. I think these are all examples of Europe acting uh, you know, in, a, in a cohesive, future-oriented and in humane way, um, you know, and I think, so I'm, I'm a believer in Europe, and I'm also a believer that Europe will have a, a growing role in Asia, and a far more important one than the U.S., because after all, Europe and Asia actually share this mega continent of Eurasia. Uh, Europeans have a long history here. There's uh, obviously a very large number of Europeans who live here. Uh, European trade with Asia is much larger than European trade with America. And that's uh, one of the central uh, infographics and charts in the book shows how, and Europeans may not even realize this, but European trade with America and Canada together is about $1 trillion a year, which is a decent amount. But European trade with Asia is about $1.6 trillion a year. So your economic future right, is far more pinned to Asia uh, than it is to North America. And certainly because you're exporting more and European economies, especially Germany, are export oriented. Of course, you have a large population and, and so forth, but you have a high savings rate and relatively low consumption. So trade with Asia matters a lot uh, to Germany and to Europe. And so that's why European governments, since again, this, this period of time that I mark as you know one of the key milestones of the Asian uh, sort of century, the mid to mid 2010s, European governments started to join the Belt and Road Initiative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and push very hard for more trade deals. Europe has a free trade agreement with, uh, with Japan now, with Korea, with Vietnam, would like to have one with ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries. And the Americans have obviously taken a very different approach. They've pulled out of the major trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and so on. So Europe really does have the right strategy um, towards, towards Asia. And so I'm quite, quite bullish about that in the long, long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Partnerships, that brings me to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that's just been signed by 14 Asia Pacific states. Um, so it, it seemed uh, that, uh, well, it, 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 it is a very important agreement, of course, but someone wants to know, is it not overrated according to some recent comments comparing the EU Asian trade deals with Asia? Well, so the, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership do, it, even though it's not 100% free trade, it's not like the European Union or, the, or so rather the Eurozone, but it's, it's relatively close. The key innovation is you know, since tariffs were already getting lower between Asian countries, the key is around some of these technical issues like rules of origin, where now you, know, you make one thing in multiple places within um, uh, Asian, you don't have to have disputes about you know, labeling and so forth. So some of these things have been now, will now be harmonized. And these logistical and regulatory barriers, overcoming them itself unlocks a lot of value. So the Regional Com e Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a big deal, but Asians practice what is called open regionalism. So yes, they are deepening regionalism through RCEP, but they also want to be part of and are part of, most of them, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
They also want to have free trade agreements with the EU. So they're practicing a global open regionalism because in general, the more such agreements you are part of, the better off you are in terms of access to markets and having you know, harmonized investment regulation and so forth. So Asians are playing this very wisely and they remain quite pro-globalization, which is obviously more than one can say from uh, that, uh, uh, about uh, Western societies right now. Mm -hmm. What about India? India wanted to be part, but it's not now. So what is the effect of that? Well, I mean, if India wanted to be part of RCP, it would be part of RCP. But India clearly does not want to be part of RCP, even though it should be part of RCP. Well, at first, it seemed they wanted, and now they are not not in. No, so I mean, again, if you yeah. want something, you, you know, if, if <laughs> yeah. India, if India were a person and India wants to sign something, then India would sign something. Okay. But India, in the form of its present leadership says it wants to trade more with East Asia. And yes, it is trading more with East Asia. And it wants to reduce its trade deficits with East Asia because India has very large deficits with China, with Japan and other countries. In other words, it imports a lot of their commodities and food or, or you know, uh, other goods, manufactured goods, and doesn't export enough. Now, their view was that um, the RCEP would disadvantage them even further because they're not very competitive. They would wind up importing even more from other countries who make things faster, better, and cheaper. So India would like to ideally eventually join RCEP, but once it is more competitive. The other caveat, which is fair from India's uh, point of view, is that RCEP is not a high standard trade agreement in terms of intellectual property protections in areas like software. And India's largest export is software. It's well over $100 billion a year of software exports. So if the agreement does not cover Indian software, why join it? So that is the debate happening in India, but you can't have it both ways. You can't join, but have it protect software. You know, you can't join, but you know, forestall the flood of goods until you are more competitive. Either you join or you don't join. So India will eventually join. And the RCEP members were extremely clear in their declaration that they strongly welcome and want India to join and that the door is always open. So I think it was a very amicable understanding that India is just not yet in, that, in, in the position. And by the way, India did the same thing two years ago with global trade negotiations on agriculture, right? There were strong efforts to bring down Uh, you know, restrictions to food imports um, and, you know, genetically modified seeds and these kinds of things. And India stood up and said, absolutely no way. We are an agricultural country. We cannot have our farmers be flooded or, you know, our markets be flooded with foreign goods that are competing with our local production. And we need to have some safeguards to protect our farmers. And India stood up for its position, you know, based on its uh, economic and social composition. And that's what governments are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Well, your book is called uh, Commerce, Conflict and Culture. So let's move on a little bit to the conflict side. You've mentioned already a couple of conflicts. Um, and with India, we are certainly hearing uh, one. What are the uh, potential fields or the big fields of conflict culturally, politically, well, economically, we've already talked a little bit. Well, there's many, you know, um, I, and I, I'm, I don't uh, suppress, you know, this aspect of the story. Like you said, the subtitle of the book has the word conflict uh, in it. So, um, you know, I, I, Asia is home to all of the major World War III scenarios that exist in the world, right? If World War III is going to happen, it's going to happen in Asia. There are conflicts in Asia. There are tensions in Asia. There are rivalries in Asia all the time. You name it. Uh, Taiwan, South China Sea, North Korea, Senkaku Islands, Kashmir, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, India-China border, many, many very serious flashpoints. But there's a couple of things that one has to keep in mind. You know, the Cold War ended 30 years ago. And for 30 years, people have been saying, World War III is going to happen in Asia. You know, it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> And, you, you know, for 30 years, they've been wrong. They didn't say it would happen the next day, and it still could happen. But the point is, it's more interesting to look at why certain conflicts do not happen 
than simply assuming that they will happen because you will learn a lot more studying the 364 days a year where the conflicts and tensions are managed than the one day a year where there is a flare up, right? An escalation. And Asians have done a good job of integrating geoeconomically. Look at RCEP, look at the trade relations between China, Japan, and Korea. They are rivals, but they trade $4.5 trillion a year in intermediate goods. The most dense trade relationship by volume on the planet is China, Japan, and Korea. That's four and a half trillion dollars, right? That's, that's uh, Ger Germany's GDP, roughly, something like that. Um, so uh, because of their, their integrated supply chains. So you, they've managed the geoeconomic integration, but, but suppressed their geopolitical rivalries. Now that could change tomorrow, right? Taiwan, China could invade Taiwan tomorrow. Uh, there could be war between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands tomorrow. North Korea could launch a nuclear weapon tomorrow, right? China and the Philippines could, and in Vietnam could be fighting it out over islands in the South China Sea tomorrow. And none of that, absolutely none of that invalidates my argument, right? Because for two reasons. One, when you have a war, that is, again, proof that you have a system. Again, Europe has been a system for thousands of years. It has been a violent, conflictual system for thousands of years, but it has been a system. And the proof that you are a system is that you have so much friction and tension and, and, and interdependence with each other that you represent a system, but a violent system. But Asia has actually been a peaceful system for 30 years, and hopefully it will stay that way. But the point is, it, I, my argument is not that Asia will be peaceful. My argument is that Asia is a system and it uh, operates according to its own logic. The second reason why, if you have one of these conflicts, uh, it doesn't invalidate the argument is because unlike Europe in 1914 or the 1940s, where one conflict took down you know, the whole region, set back the whole region, destroyed an entire region of the world, just remember how much bigger Asia is, right? All of Europe fits inside one corner of Asia, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And instead of one civilization, right? One common heritage and one geography where one power, let's say Germany, for example, or France in the 18th and early 19th centuries can pretend that they could dominate the whole region, right? And march with their armies in all directions, right? That cannot happen in Asia. Asia's too big, right? And it's not one civilization, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you can uh, convince yourself that all Europeans can be forced to speak French or German, but you will never have all Asians speaking Chinese or Hindi, right? Mm -hmm. It will never happen. Mm -hmm. So again, the rules of Asia are different. The analogy does not even work, right? So even if you had one war in Asia, let's say Taiwan, let's say South China Sea, let's say North Korea, let's say you have three wars in Asia, even if you have three wars in Asia at the same time, Asia is so big that it's not going to derail the whole Asian story. You're still going to have economic growth. You're still going to have populations urbanizing. You're still going to have technology investment, right? All of those things are still going to happen in Asia because a war over here doesn't mean a war over here. In European history, a war over here does mean a war over here right? Chain reactions, alliance effects, right? Again, in Asia, you don't have alliances. You don't have these chain reactions. Instead, where you have a conflict, it remains isolated to that location between those countries. And the third thing I'll add is, if you have that war, that war will also end. And when that war ends, you move on. You settle the border, you have a new agreement or a treaty, and the countries learn that they have to accept that reality. And that is what Asians and Europeans and, or any people have in common, right? Is that once it's over, it's over, right? So you could have a 1945 moment in Asia. I don't think it would be a cataclysmic world war, right? It would be a local war. It would be a tragic war. It would be a violent war. It would be an unnecessary you know, war. It would be a bad thing, but you would also have a settlement a solution, a treaty, and history would move on. Mm -hmm. And that's what could happen. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And when you talk about the, uh, the Asian system, I want to add something else that is, that is important to a system, certainly, is 
which is education. What, what would you say uh, is the typical Asian education like? What are the pillars there? Of course, you said uh, some, many are educated, of course, in uh, America or in Europe. So what, what is the future of that? Well, you know, there, there isn't really one Asian educational system. I, I, I talk about this in the early part of the book where I, you know, sort of Asians are not uh, so cosmopolitan that they do not have, you know, heavily nationalized educational systems that gloriously reflect their own histories to the detriment of others. Of course, they do that um, as fanatically as anywhere in the world, if not more so, right? And I, I'm very clear about that. And that's one of the reasons that I also wrote the book was to write an Asian history, not a Chinese history, not an Indian history, not an Indonesian history, not a Persian history or a Turkic history, but an Asian history. And that was the hardest part of the book to write by far, because I couldn't find a common Asian history that all Asians would agree to. I can find common facts, you know, even facts about history, of course, are heavily disputed. That's why Koreans and Japanese still can't get along. So it took me about one year to write 40 pages of this book um, because it was such a painful and, 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 uh, and thankless task <laughs> to try to tell one version of the truth, one version of Asian history that a Filipino or a Pakistani or a Kazakh or a, or a Vietnamese person could agree to. And actually what has been gratifying is that that, that worked. It seems to have worked. A lot of people tell me that, it, that they learned Asian history um, rather than just learning their own country's history. So that all of that is to say that there isn't obviously one educational system. People like to generalize about Asia outside Asia and say, oh, they just sit in the classroom and they memorize things and they stick their heads down and they go blind, uh, you know, memorizing facts. Um, that is true in some places, but obviously not true universally. You know, in the PISA exams now, they have these creative problem solving components and the kids from Shanghai and the kids from Shing Singapore are doing better than the kids from Germany and the kids from England, right? Um, but the kids from the Czech Republic and Finland are doing as well as some of the Asian kids. So you cannot, again, you cannot say Asians are not creative. You cannot say Asians are not innovative. Um, you know, just look at the pop music charts. It's all Korean music these days. Um, so, you know, how can one possibly generalize, um, you know, about Asian education? So things are changing very fast here in Singapore. And Singapore is, of course, always an outlier. It's a tiny country. It's a very wealthy country. It's a very, you know, anglicized country because of colonialism. But they are getting rid of some of the toughest standardized tests. They don't want, you know, school children to spend all day in the classroom. They're forcing them to go out in the sunshine. Um, you know, memorization is going out the, the, the window. In the early year, first year of university, they do not have to get grades on their exams anymore. You just, mm -hmm. just study, just learn, just explore, mm -hmm. dabble. Mm -hmm. These are not things that you would expect Asian education system to do, but they're, that's exactly what they're doing. And I think that's obviously a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, economic col collaboration on the one hand, and then often political, I would say, competition, something like that, especially when it comes to China, uh, that has become an economic friend to us. But often we feel like it's, uh, yeah, I don't really want to use the term enemy, but, but a political, you know, opposite. Actually, our former, former German foreign minister, Gabriel, he was on TV last week here in one of the big stations, and he said China was something like a frenemy. Uh, how can we overcome those political conflicts? Well, I mean, I, uh, I did start using that word frenemy uh, a long time ago, actually, in my, my first book. And I said that Europe, America, and, um, and, and, and China, you know, are sort of three frenemies. Um, now, obviously, the, the scales are tilted somewhat. But the whole point is, goes back to what I was saying about how Asian powers view the world. They don't choose to align with one side or the other, they practice multi-alignment. And that's the complexity of the world today, you know, of everyone having multi-directional multi relations with everyone else. And that, those complex threads 
are part of how you mitigate conflict in the first place. And that is the kind of, you know, age old uh, dichotomy or, or, or uh, tension between the idea of globalization, meaning interdependence and integration versus geopolitics which signals, you know, division and rivalry and tension and conflict. And the truth is that they're both, they're two sides of the same coin, right? They're all happening at the same time. Um, so I don't know if there is any way to eliminate these tensions. I mean, I do think that there is a scenario, a very happy scenario, where we have spheres of influence, if you will, natural spheres of influence, but you have a race to the top in terms of the quality of governance or services provided in order to justify that sphere of influence rather than having it by conquest. And you have resource sharing and knowledge sharing across these regions that may be competing with each other for market share, mm. but not for territory. And I do think that we, we sort of live in that world now, even though we also live in a world of rivalry geopolitically. Again, both of these things are happening at the same time because geopolitics and globalization coexist at the same time because they are two sides, two sides of the same coin. That, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. I like the term happy scenario. Um, some, someone else wants to know, speaking, which is an important question, I think, speaking about global warming, what scenarios of cooperation do you see here, considering that there might be a challenge to dealing with this together with questions of prosperity and equality? Well, that's, that's definitely an area where you could sort of, again, have a happy scenario. There's plenty of things that we could and should work on together. And, and you know, the obvious one is climate change. Um, but, but quite frankly, before climate change became the hot button issue that it is today, we could have been talking and still need to be talking about poverty, about failed states, you know, post-conflict reconstruction. There has been a broad... Uh, you know, viable, sensible global agenda for a long time. Now we can add climate change very urgently and should, of course, to that list. And the question is, um, what is a fair approach? You know, on whose shoulders does certain responsibility, do certain responsibilities lie? Uh, are we doing these things fast enough? Um, you know, who is providing public goods? Uh, which institutions or powers? How can we do more technology transfer to the places that need it uh, to reduce their emissions and to reduce their consumption of water and energy, this kind of thing? So, you know, I think that this is uh, an area uh, where there should not only be cooperation, but in a way, healthy competition to profit from making the world better, if that's what it takes to get powers to think in that way. Um, that's the way China thinks about solar panels, right? China used industrial policy to copy and internalize solar panel technology, and now it leads the world in it. And now the whole world is buying solar panels from China. So China is making money off of something that is good for the world. Now, so is that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, I mean, the way in which they went about dominating the industry put a lot of other people out of business but China is able to do things faster and cheaper and at scale better than other countries can. So we would have to go back in time and say, you know, would Americans have sold solar panels all across Africa and the Middle East and all of these places as quickly as China is doing it? Probably not necessarily, right? We don't know. But never mind what happened in the past. Should everyone be making efforts to reduce fossil fuel consumption and reduce emissions and um, you know, do water conservation projects and all of these things in, uh, in the industrializing world? The answer is of course, yes. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about China's or actually Asia's uh, uh, rising or expanding influence, um, you said you, you talked about Africa. That's, I just wanna, wanna, wanna tackle that for just a moment. Um, how can that be seen in, in, in the African context? The Asian influence. Well, 
so Africa, you know, again, a lot of people look at it primarily from the outside in. They say that, you know, this is uh, Europe, you know, former European colonies and Europe's backyard. Uh, and now China is coming in and colonizing Africa and so forth. And I don't like to view Africa in those uh, terms, you know, uh, because the truth is it's a very, it's a shifting geopolitical landscape. Africa is first and foremost in African hands. Uh, you know, again, this is a post-colonial region. There's 50 plus countries. They have political sovereignty. They also are becoming somewhat more of a system, not an intensely integrated one, but you know, more interdependent than before. They're trying to have an African free trade area, uh, African visa free mobility for all Africans around uh, the continent. They're working on these things. An African development bank is financing sustainable agriculture projects. Uh, China is building infrastructure that benefits Africans across borders. They don't just do projects in one country, in this country, in that country. They're also doing projects that allow these countries to connect better to each other. In a way, if Europe created the scramble for Africa and carved up Africa, a lot of what China is doing is helping Africans to unscramble themselves. And uh, that's something that I've been writing about and reporting about for, for a long time. There are benefits. There's a reason why uh, many African countries appreciate these Chinese infrastructure projects. But that doesn't mean that it's all, all about China. Mm. There are far more Indians in Africa than there are Chinese people in Africa obviously because of the British empire, right? So the Indian influence in Africa is rising. Europe is working on a new set of strategies for Africa. The United States has contributed a lot of assistance to Africa. So it's, uh, as with any other part of the world, you know, it's, uh, it's, it is very, it's, it's less connected than Asia is to the world, mm -hmm. but it's getting, you know, it has been getting more connected and that what has generally been good for Africa. What about the Middle East countries? Well, I don't use the term Middle East. I don't. I don't like that term, and I, I uh, sort of I go to great lengths to denounce the term. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think I I have for the last fifteen years. I think in, in all of my books because I'm trained in geography, and there's no such thing as the Middle East in geography. In geography, we actually use geographical points of reference, not um, destinational sort of references. And then the term Middle East, as you know is really just about how long it takes to refuel a ship when you're traveling from London to India, which is not really important in the 21st century. <laughs> But geography is far more timeless. So we can talk about North Africa, Arab North Africa. We can talk about the Gulf countries. You can call it the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf as you like. We can talk about the West Asian countries, which is the term I prefer. And West Asia is in fact the Gulf countries. It is, um, the Levantine countries, it's the Mashrek countries, so Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Turkey, these are all Asian countries by geography, right? Um, and this is something that those people in the ge geographic West Asia increasingly understand. Um, and I spend a whole chapter of the, the book uh, on this because again, we tend to think, we meaning you and me and people with our background tend to think of this region as the Middle mm -hmm. East and being historically and still today, you know, linked to or dependent on our policies and trade. And that's literally just not true. That's just factually wrong. Mm -hmm. Since the 1990s, the Gulf countries have traded much more with China, Korea, Japan, and India than they do with the West. Especially you in Europe don't really buy Arab oil anymore and don't need it because you have been innovating your way out of that dependence. You get natural mm. gas from Russia and North, mm. and North Africa and the Arctic. Um, but the point is that, you know, these places are now doing infrastructure deals with China. They're mo many of the pop, much of the population, of course, of the Arabian Gulf countries is Indian, ethnic mm. Indian, in, uh, Indian nationals who are permanently or semi-permanently living in those countries. Mm. So there's almost nothing Middle East, you know, left about many of these places. They are West Asia. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they have a very different fate, the fate of North Africa and versus the fate of Iraq and Syria and, or the fate of Saudi Arabia or Turkey. These are four completely different answers 
to the same question. So that's why I never, ever use the term Middle East, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to talk about Iraq if you want to talk about Iraq yeah. or Saudi Arabia if you want to talk about Saudi Arabia or Egypt if you want to talk about Egypt. But these places, you know, they are not that much of a system. Let's put it that way, right? The Middle mm -hmm. East, again, they're geographically very close to each other, but, you know, they're a, they're a terrible system, a very mm -hmm. weak system and certainly a very conflictual system and most of these countries barely trade with each other at all mm -hmm. well i'd love to talk to you for, <laughs> for much much longer but our time is already almost running out so let me um, finish with two more uh, or broader questions uh, one is would you agree that uh, growth in asia would lead to more global justice Well, I mean, if you define justice, you know, as uh, access, opportunity, um, you know, obviously ability to have a basic, uh, you know, humane standard of living, then everything that Asia does in terms of economic growth is enhancing justice, you know, and then most of the public officials of the last 30 years have praised India and China for their poverty reduction initiatives as you know, obviously uplifting billions of people. And that's obviously part of the notion of, uh, you know, at least economic justice, social justice is having that, you know, basic level of education and material welfare and access to food and so forth. So that process does continue in Asia. It has these terrible environmental externalities, right, which can be unjust in some ways for the rest of the world. Because even though climate change, you know, one may say, Uh, dates back to the Western Industrial Revolution. Obviously, China and India and other countries are among the worst perpetrators today, you know, adding, uh, you know, more fuel to the fire. So we have to balance these things. But, you know, do Asians believe that their societies are increasingly just because of economic growth and because of that, you know, rising uh, uh, opportunity that is spreading to the masses? Yes, they certainly do. Mm -hmm. And that's why even leaders who we think of outside of Asia uh, uh, as being terrible and illiberal, like in India or the Philippines, they are the most popular leaders on earth, right? Even Angela Merkel is not as popular as Modi in India. <laughs> Certainly not now because of the COVID lockdowns, uh -huh. um, but or or Duterte in Indonesia. Now we can speak as as uh, you know we can use colloquial language here. We think of these leaders as thugs, right? We think of them as ill, liberal, murderous, mm -hmm. chauvinistic thugs. Mm -hmm. But they're democratically elected leaders, and they're the most popular leaders on the planet Earth mm -hmm. by far, mm -hmm. by far. And these are these are you know, open free societies where you can go and conduct a survey and we have many surveys and you have to understand why you have to force yourself to understand why mm. these people that we despise, at least in based on our principles and our values, why are they so popular? It cannot be that 1 billion Indians have no values. Mm. It cannot be that 100 million Filipinos have no values, right? What they want to see is a basic, decent quality of life, law and order, public safety, education, food, you know, these kinds of electricity supply, things that they have not had for decades, mm -hmm. decades, decades. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I'm not seeking in any way to justify or rationalize or legitimize anyone. Mm -hmm. But if we're not going to understand these basic psychological and political conditions and realities and, and worldviews of more than half the world's population, then I don't think we'll be making any diplomatic progress mm. in the future. Yeah. Diplomatic progress. So these are to my very last question. Which contribution can cultural policy add to strengthen our relations? And uh, what role can institutions like the IFA play in that context? Well, Very simple question. <laughs> I, would, I would love to see more of an emphasis on cultural diplomacy. And in, in my life, cultural diplomacy has taken the form of travel and language, you know, spending time and immersing in foreign societies and therefore developing certain sympathy, understanding, empathy, you know, for them and trying to, to the extent possible, help them, but based upon their own conditions and realities uh, at that point in time. And I think that cult that is what cultural diplomacy seeks to promote, understanding, appreciation, learning, um, you know, and again, putting oneself in, in another shoes. And that, that's, 
in a way, it shouldn't require the, modif the modifier cultural diplomacy. That is what diplomacy is supposed to be. It should have that cultural element innate to it in how we think about it, how we practice it. Um, and I think you know, that's historically consistent if we think about diplomacy in Europe in the, in the Renaissance era, if we think about even diplomacy in ancient times in the Mesopotamian region, cult culture was an, a very important part of diplomacy. And in many cases, it was the driving uh, force or factor. Um, so I do think that organizations uh, such as yourselves are, play a very important role. And again, you know, we have um, this opportunity in terms of the global digital connectivity Hopefully we'll restore global travel again. The mm -hmm. fact is that the incentives to travel and live in other societies for the sake of one's own economic welfare and professional opportunity, those incentives are growing, not shrinking, because we have such a mismatch in the world between where people are and where people are needed, you know, where the labor force is versus where economic opportunity is. And if we actually can overcome those gaps and, and move people around more, um, you know, not only would that be better for global society and, and justice in many ways, but it would require obviously a lot more cultural understanding because our societies would become even more diverse uh, than, than they are now. And that certainly applies to Germany and to Europe where you've had so many new migrants over the last 50 years in general and of course, the last 10 years and 15 years in particular. And, um, you know, I think it will be in stops and starts, ebbs and flows, but the tide of history points towards more diversity um, for regions such as Europe that have labor shortages. And therefore, cultural diplomacy is not something necessary that you have to get on a plane to go and do. Cultural diplomacy is coming to you in your own, uh, you know, backyard. Mm -hmm. Well, the tide of time is unfortunately showing that uh, our uh, time is almost over. And at this point, Parag, this was a wonderful talk. So enthusiastic, insightful and dynamic. And uh, I think we've all learned a lot. It was a lot to conquer topic wise uh, in a short period of time, certainly. But thank you for uh, sharing all your insights with us. Thank you for being with us today. And I've seen a lot of very applauding comments already in our chat. So that, that is a, 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 nice, uh, a nice feedback, I think, that I wanted to share with you. Thank you for taking your time for us today. And uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining. That was our online talk, the Asian 21st century. Well, on behalf of the IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, uh, thank you for joining us. And I hope and I'm, well, I'm sure you've enjoyed your time with us and have a good time sharing all the insights that you have gained today. And uh, well, you've seen in the, uh, in the chat also the link to uh, our newsletter and studies. And so you can so certainly uh, sign up there and uh, also use our Twitter channel again. It's the IFA Kult Extern. And uh, well, have a wonderful day, rest of the week and a great holiday season. And uh, well, stay healthy. Bye-bye and tschüss and thanks to Parag. Bye-bye.